Hi, my name is Frederik Kerling and I am Quantum Expert and Cybersecurity Consultant at ATOS. In these next few sessions, we will be discussing how our knowledge gaps about quantum uh, are impacting how we look at business and our business cases and how becoming more quantum native allows us to adopt more possible options for our future organizations in using quantum computing. In creating business cases, we'll find that many knowledge gaps exist. We'll look at a specific one. What does it really mean to provide a solution? Now this poses some sub-questions. What is the purpose of providing a solution? And what components are there in the process of providing a solution? And how does this change in quantum? So what does it mean? What does it actually mean to provide solutions? Well, we solve problems as a resolution to real life problems. We believe a problem is solved once we have the results of our real life solution that resolves our original problem. This means that in a perfect world, all device solutions have an accompanying problem that they solve. For now, we ignore that in reality, many problems exist without solutions and many solutions exist without problems, especially in IT. For every problem to solution iteration, the following steps are followed. First, we encounter a real problem. Second, we formulate this problem into language, often mathematical language. Thirdly, with effort and time, a solution is found to the problem. Fourthly, we formulate the solution into language, often mathematical language. Fifthly, with effort and time, a method of running the solution is found. Step six, we execute the solution on available technology. And step seven, we receive and interpret our found solutions to solve the real life problem. To make a solution to a problem, we need use cases. To arrive at a real life solution to a real life problem, we need to follow these steps one to seven into a so-called use case. You might think to yourself, that's pretty obvious. Why even bother? Well, there's two ways of looking at it. Firstly, in classical terms, and secondly, in quantum terms. Each of these seven steps can be done either in a classical way or in a quantum way. Now, it is interesting to look at how long we've been doing these things in a classical way and for how long we've been doing it in a quantum way. Firstly, real life problems have existed in quantum for let's say the beginning of the universe. So that's about 13.8 billion years ago. Problem formulation is not really done yet in a quantum way. So the question mark, because right now it's unclear exactly how many problem formulation ever existed from a quantum formulation uh, from the start. Now finding solutions is strictly classical. We are human beings and we are limited to our classical brain and our classical interpretation. Um, so far. I cannot exclude that in the future we'll have some sort of a quantum hybrid brain implanted in ourselves. Solution formulation is about 26 years ago. This is from 1994 when Peter Shor devised his first useful quantum algorithm for useful uh, real-life problems. There were other quantum algorithms but they didn't actually solve real-life problems. Again, finding compute methods is strictly classical because we are simply limited to our human capacity. The solution execution is available since about 2019 when IBM provided the first commercially available quantum computer. Solutions to problems, they exist about 60 years since we first started using semiconductors with quantum knowledge. Of course, semiconductors in itself are much older but let's say this is the first time we actually started to use quantum technology to uh, provide solutions to our problems, in this case, computing problems. Now, this means that problem formulation in quantum terms is not only key, but it is entirely new to our civilization. Needless to say, there isn't much work done yet in this field and formulating problems in a quantum way, not even scientifically. Um, because, well, we've never done it. We have created our entire uh, way of working based on normal classical computing, and we've done so for 50 years, even in science. There's no reason why we would have considered it differently. So let's look at an example. 
In this case, the example is comorbidities. A patient is classified with a set of morbidity syndromes. We want to know how these syndromes group so that we can develop group syndrome drugs. Uh, as now there is only a single drug per single syndrome, and once you have more than one syndrome, this creates drug complications. Now, each patient is represented as a vector, and one means that the syndrome is present, and a zero means that it's not present. After a lot of classical computing, you'll get this correlation map, and we'll try to find the so-called max cut, the optimal cut of the most correlated syndromes. For that, we use a quantum algorithm called QAOA, uh, and we're going to look for a max cut. Now, this allows for an optimal group to be found. This is, in this case, the red dotted curve. Now, let's see what would happen if, instead of syndromes being present either yes or no, we introduce a random syndrome, undiscovered, unknown so far, and let's say that every patient maybe has it. So rather than a binary 0 or 1, we introduce a superposition of 0 and 1 at the same time. This is impossible for classical computers to compute. However, for the quantum algorithm, we don't even need to make any changes. It's perfectly normal to input this as data. So what would happen? There are three possibilities. Firstly, there is simply no convergence. The algorithm doesn't find a single answer because we've added too much randomness to the system. It is very likely that this happens, and we've sadly not been able yet to do this. In the specific comorbidity case, there is over 190 syndromes, and at the moment we're limited to, at the best, about 40 qubits. We're going to need at least about 250 reasonably stable qubits to do this. So, most likely there will be no conversions. But, we can also have a slightly different result. That means that there is some undiscovered illness that might change our future groups, which means that we can actually very targetively search for this new illness and maybe even find, find it so that we know in the future um, what kind of new illnesses or syndromes we have to look for. The best result is, of course, if we get the exact same result, irrespective of the added randomness. That the, it means that the grouping we made for these drugs, so that we can have grouped syndrome drugs, is resistant to undiscovered syndromes. It means that if we create that drug, it's not going to need a lot of change if in the future some undiscovered other syndrome is going to be introduced that might change the need for this specific grouping. It means our grouping, our drug, is future resistant to undiscovered illnesses. Our group is, so to say, complete. Uh, that is, of course, something extremely interesting. And simply by adding something that we do not know, we've managed to make a prediction and a assurance for the future that with a classical computer we could have never done. This is one of the examples why it is so interesting to formulate your problems from a quantum way, simply because we're going to get going to get to answers we never had before. Whether or not all of this will work is a big question mark for the future, but it is good to think in advance about how we can approach our problems in a quantum way because maybe we will discover new insights we couldn't have had before. In our next and final session, we will actually discuss which parts of your organization needs to be present in order to think about such problem formulations in a quantum way and to reopen your eyes to a different way of solving problems. Stay tuned for next, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out via either LinkedIn or Twitter. Stay home, stay safe, 